time, maybe some of you remember, um, we had an exhibition of Thomas' timeline, work, public, work in public space, right, which was a large collage, and we had it here in 2012. And then the second event we did, we did with Thomas here was a conversation, part of the discussions in contemporary culture, a series of public programs that DIA hosts um, on, a, on a regular basis. And this one was with Hal Foster. It was a conversation with Hal, and it was in anticipation to the monument. So this is our third and last, sadly. But... Um, it took about almost two years to prepare this book, a year and a half to be exact, which we were laughing as we were coming here because it took a year and a half to prepare the monument. So in total, I think we've worked four years on this project. So um, goes to say something about art, <laughs> takes time. So I would like to start by um, describing briefly what we do at DIA with our books, right? There's a program, it's a program that's been running for several years, um, but maybe I could say, I think since the early 80s, DIA has been making books, but in particular since it used to be across the street um, here in Chelsea, the program ran by uh, Gary Girls, and then it was run by Lynn Cook. These, these books that accompanied the exhibitions and the commissions by DIA started to take a turn towards the 90s into becoming their own projects. So breaking away from the concept of a book as a catalog or an, ex an exhibition catalog, these books began to take the form of individual projects that happen after the fact in most cases. Uh, very rarely did the books um, were ready for the opening of a project. And this um, sends, uh, it sent a new model of bookmaking. And that is why, and often the case, that the publications that the uh, sponsors are themselves um, hold um, their own autonomy, independent of the project that was commissioned. So for Gramsci Monument, this, we were following the same principle, but... Um, I would like to begin by asking you, Thomas, to ref refresh our memory as to why a manual, a book, why a book for a project that in itself was meant to be ephemeral, it, meant, it was meant to disappear, a monument, a new definition of monument that you envisioned, and um, you thought immediately from the beginning that you, you wanted a book. Yeah, why a book? Um, because it was a promise. I promised a promise. We promised it. We, I promised it to the people of forest houses that there will be a book. Uh, and not as a result of the Gramsci monument, but as a trace, as an album, as how I call it, as a manual, as a toolbox, in order to bind or glue together all kind of materials who were was achieved during, before and also after the Gramsci monument. And I think uh, to do a book is still today an interesting uh, form to bind together materials. To the, uh, in order that the whom who opens the book decide him or herself what she or he wants uh, to go in. Does uh, she or he be interested in the texts or just to look on the photos? Like in a photo album about something we made or she or he made and do you want to go back and to have uh, an idea of the atmosphere or do you want to go until the footnotes to learn about the complexity, the beauty, the difficulty of making such a project? That's why um, a book. And uh, I'm very happy, by the way, that today um, the book uh, is, is, um, is out and tomorrow, as uh, Kelly told you, we will go 
to forest houses to the book lounge and also uh, since the beginning uh, to um, to do um, to give out to everybody from forest houses a free copy but was also a promises and I'm very happy that uh, the art foundation made this possible so there are about 400 books now in forest housing waiting tomorrow of of to be given out to the to the audience from forest houses so that's why a book while we were there while the monument was taking place there were about 11 poets 11 scholars of gramsci guest scholars we had a number of people talented people that came and performed we had musicians dancers on open sundays we we could see over 20 different forms of artists showing up to the monument. There was a, a great deal of production, and, and yet um, we did select some specific authors, right? We, we made a selection from some of the people that participated, but also others that did not manage to make it to the monument, like Tony Negri. Should we Talk a little bit about how that process went about, what, what guided the selection of some of the authors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do, what do you remember? I, <laughs> I would like to start in, in, uh, the contribution of Kelly uh, together with Clyde and Eric. Kelly did an introduction, but also a, a beautiful, a beautiful um, interview uh, several months after uh, the Gramsci monument. And uh, in this interview, she asked Eric and Clyde, the who, who are so important for this monument, about their experience. And um, to me, um, one thing I could learn into, in this interview, that how, uh, uh, how they get, in a way, uh, the project and also how they uh, do to take advantage of something they were interested in. Interest, the interest of Clyde and Eric is of course the community. And for example, uh, when it's written, Clyde says, that's what we've got to do as a community. We really do. And we've got to have people at the top, our politi politicians, Eric, me, people, in the leadership roles who sincerely care about what they are doing. I mean, not just like it a little bit, but love it. That's why Gramsci Monument is really a labor of love. So, um, I was touched uh, this, that Clyde and also Eric, who said, yeah, we can't stop the art, get um, a lot of uh, um, input uh, of the Gramsci monument and were able to make it to make it so clearly to put it so clearly in words so to me uh, uh, for example this uh, interview Kelly made is uh, is a very uh, it's a, something um, like um, an extension of the Gramsci monument well, it's, it's because the book, one, one of the things I noticed as we were putting it together is that the book is not a documentation of what the monument was about. I mean, it would have been impossible to make a 24-hour even movie of, or documentary of, of, the, of the whole project or of all the conversations. When you read that quote, I remember where maybe Eric was going af about or what Eric was recalling which was probably the visit to the police office. Um, do you remember when, <laughs> at the beginning of the monument, where you told the police officers that they couldn't stop the monument? So I, I, was, I remember when I, when I read this, I, I thought of those conversations when Eric came back and said, oh, you're not going to believe what Thomas said to the chief police officer today um, in anticipation to the monument. So I think that this was the fantastic thing about Kelly's interview was that it was able to bring out conversations that were happening between us and throughout the 77 days or in preparation to the 77 days that otherwise would have gotten lost. 
I, I thought also that it was important to share with everybody that the, the other dimension of the book from the beginning when, when you said we must include the preparation notes, we must include your, what you call your field work. Why was that so important to you in terms of you know, the creation of your artwork um, to share the background, to share the process of getting there? Is there a pedagogical agenda on your part or are you thinking of artists, of younger artists or other people who, who may want to make a monument or a form of sculpture? Of course, this book had, uh, had the ambition to not to be a guideline, but the ambition to, to show uh, the complexity, the difficulty, but also uh, the work and the struggle you have in order to build such a work of art and then, of course, to, to, to give it to the discussion. So a book is a good form for it. Why? Because there are a lot of elements. They, are, um, um, they have their own uh, density. They have their own schedule. For example, the fieldwork you mentioned. There was one half year of fieldwork. Uh, but then the monument was only um, for 77 days. So, but the 77 days is the public moment. A moment are, the, are, are, are giving the public moments. But the other, the all days of fieldwork are has to me the same importance. So, and this, therefore, I think the book is a very good uh, form uh, to lay it out. I want to give an example. Uh, uh, another example: Why in a book we can um, we can take care on things that it's um, not so easy when you are with another medium? Is for example um, the absence, the absence, uh, and one of the absences of the Gramsci monument was the absence when there was the field trips, you know, uh, every week. Uh, every uh, week, actually you, the ambassador, Yasmil, you went from the Gramsci monument out to, um, to a site in New York City, somewhere, and uh, with some uh, residents from forest houses. So, uh, and uh, actually these people uh, were at this moment not at the Gramsci monument, so not visible, they were absent. And, uh, when you are a visitor of the Gramsci monument, you couldn't see them, of course, because they were out. So in the book, we could, and therefore I'm very happy, we could um, put the pictures of all of these field trips uh, you made together with several of the residents. So this is, for example, an, ex an example why uh, I think uh, a book is a good form to put together things, they have uh, all together to be a part of the Gramsci monument, but they are in not, they have not the same visibility and also not the same um, time, um, uh, time um, um, accelerator. So uh, there are other things I think are very important. For example, the text of the Gramsci theater you know, there was the Gramsci Theater every week, every Monday of the week, and uh, um, it was the, te the text was a text which was complicated to hear because and to listen to it because people did shout together, and that was uh, uh, um, important because there was a lot of shouting at the same time. So, the in the book after, we can uh, uh, print out the text of uh, the, the, the Marcus text of the theater. So it's a good form, I think, to, to, uh, to, give, uh, to give form to, to this part, for example. And I think that's where the book becomes a resource, really. Uh, I feel that when I was looking at Marcus' um, play, and um, one looks at the selection of philosophers that he chose to quote from or evoke um, in his writing, 
one sees that he constructed a bibliography, a clear bibliography of relationships between um, Alain Badou, Gramsci, and so on, different people, Marguerite Duras, his favorites. It's a bibliography of, of Marco Steinweg's favorites. And for us, it was important. I remember when we were thinking what else to include, right? We had so much abundance of material, and we decided it was really important to include the list of books from the Kamet collection. For those of you who, who went to the monument and saw the library that was there, um, you n remember that we had about 500 books that we borrowed from Queens College, CUNY, um, Italian American Institute, Calde Calandra in this in Institute. And this um, loan, which was an incredible generosity on the part of, of Dean Tamburi to let us borrow uh, Professor Kamet's library, which was not only on Gramsci, but anything Italian. It was, I mean, included uh, Marx's books, uh, it included uh, food tourism, it included uh, books about Leonardo da Vinci, art, Italo Calvino, but also, obviously, uh, a great number of books on Gramsci. And when we, we thought it was important to, to include it, because it's a resource. Kamet has been, spent most of his life preparing what is known the Bibliographia Gramsciana. And um, today you can find it, but we thought it was incredible to make this accessible in another way, which we made the Kamet Bibliography. And just looking over it the other day, I, I, remember, I started noticing the names of people who came to the monument who we had books. <laughs> from. Um, we had book Kate, do you remember Kate Crehan? Um, we had uh, Stanley Aronowitz, people who did not participate as scholars of the lectures, but who came and visited us. So it was a great way of, so, of remembering their contribution, which included um, uh, texts on Gramsci and so forth. For those of you who saw the monument, um, the principle for the scholars to be invited was that they had to have written a book on Gramsci. Right? You remember that? And that makes us, that made us uh, make decisions, even people who we knew knew a lot about Gramsci, but they had not written about Gramsci, we didn't invite them. So, same time, although the monument is your work, an artwork by Thomas Hirschen, we did have, um, and we feel that in the book, that the book is also a contribution to that bibliography on Gramsci, that eventually, uh, when someone is looking for Gramsci's prison notebooks, they may encounter Gramsci monument. <laughs> of course, this is, this is joining the idea of the book as a toolbox, and uh, to me, uh, Book lists are always important, so also in my work, but here in this book we are very happy that we could print out all the books where who was exhibited in the Gramsci monument. I want to mention, uh, you, you mentioned it shortly, the, uh, there was the daily lectures of Marcus Steinweg, the philosopher, and um, um, a few people, a very few people could attend every day, for, for sure. Uh, I had the chance, you had the chance, because we were there every day. And in the book, uh, for example, we, but we had this uh, occasion to print out all of the lecture, or uh, almost all the titles of the lectures of Marcus. So somebody who was not there, or only there one day, he can hear, he can see and find out about the lecture from the day before or after. So there are also, there, here also I think ma making a book makes sense. Hmm. Speaking of, of Gramsci, because he, his writing, his life was important to, to us, we, we did spend a great deal of time for every newspaper there was something, uh, included a reprint or included a, a letter by Gramsci or we tried to um, match it to the guest speakers um, as well. One of the scholars that we couldn't bring was Tony Negri. And um, 
it was it's an enormous pleasure that we managed to, to convince him to contribute to the book, a text that was then translated from Italian into, into English. And, um, and one in which he wrestles with the legacy of Gramsci, which for many years, for, for Antonio Negri, those of you familiar with his work, um, know that he, he couldn't reconcile Gramsci in his own writing, his struggle, and he says that he encountered Gramsci on three moments in his life, he feels, in part because of the control or the monopoly that the Italian Communist Party had on the legacy of Gramsci that he felt um, was an issue as he was growing up. One of the things that is interesting to me, in particular at the beginning, is the title, right? Gramsci, A Testimony, which so wonderfully captures, I feel, also the function of this book, that today we can look at it and see it as a record, as a diary, or a testimony as to what, what Gramsci meant um, for this project. And I guess it would be... In, Good to share. How was uh, how would you see today the impact of Gramsci after the monument in in your life and your thinking? Where do you put Gramsci now after having spent four years in this endeavor? Um, I just want to come back that what you mentioned about Antonio Negri, who was not able to come to New York City, but there was actually. In the, in the exhibition space, there was a shelf dedicated to Antonio Negri. And this was good also in the book, it is good to have the picture who can testimony of this uh, engagement we, we get. Um, to me, of course, uh, 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 the starting point why Gramsci was his fantastic sentence, um, every human being is an intellectual. And to me, uh, the experience in, uh, in forest houses with the residents, with the visitors, but also with the people who came to enlighten me about Gramsci, the scholars, uh, really reinforced this, uh, uh, the sense of this sentence to me. Every human being is an intellectual. So um, uh, I, 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 can, I can just say that um, um, this is a personal experience to me where I am privileged of because I was there all the time. So I had uh, 11 different uh, enlight enlightings of the work and the life of Antonio Gramsci. And uh, we have a 14th one, which is the text actually you mentioned from Tony Negri. And of course, uh, I have a kind of kaleidoscope now uh, uh, of, of, the, of the work and the, the, and the meaning of the thinking of Antonio Gramsci that uh, in before, before I made the Gramsci monument was not, um, not so colorful um, uh, and not so... Um, uh, um, that's why I, I tell you sp spectral, you know? Uh, so that's what achieved me to me, um, also the Gramsci monument, to make the thinking of Gramsci spectral. So, um, but I would also um, come back to uh, something, to one of the uh, contributions. It's the contribution of Monkso Lopez, Monkso Lopez, who uh, was somebody uh, I, I meet as a chance as a chance, because he was working at this time as a cartographer at the NYCHA, uh, in the NYCHA building uh, in Manhattan. And uh, actually he wrote a fantastic text uh, called, with a beautiful title, Gramsci's Gramsci and Hirschhorn's Gramsci, in also a kind of response to your question. And um, what I really love in his text that I don't know, is it because he works also as a cartographer, 
I don't want to, um, uh, to diminute it to them. He wrote, Thomas Hirschman built a micro city, a geographical entity with an expir expiration date. The general idea, geographies shift, but their meanings and message can remain. Converse and inspire will pass their expiration dates. I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful um, contribution. And uh, also something I really uh, love in um, how uh, the text, uh, actually why we asked Moncho, Moncho to do a text, because himself he, um, he took over uh, the Gramsci monument and uh, was part of it because he came and did um, uh, did uh, music and uh, brought his friends with. And what I like a lot in his text, in his contribution, that he puts the important about places and just want to give a sentence, uh, a, a quote, Gramsci monument was a reminder that places are the physical locals where we make revolution happen. Places are first and foremost, the ground where we become free. It's a beautiful uh, uh, affirmation of monks. So um, um, I'm very happy about uh, this contribution, unexpected and uh, graceful. Speaking of places, I mean, the decision of choosing forest houses, that, that whole process that you describe it, which took about a year and a half of field work, becomes rather clear, I would say, when we enter the, fa the part of the book that is the phase of construction, right? Where we see for the first time that you've gone through all the different housing authorities. We see all the pictures that you collected of Lefrak City, Co-op City, uh, Castle Hills, and then you sh finally show the chosen site, which is forest houses. Do you um, mind telling us a little bit just talking about how, how we got there, how that space got chosen, and, or is there, I mean, the, the selection of images was so difficult for us to make, to reveal the, the examples or the particularities, right? You had a, we went through thousands of images and we were looking after a particular kind of image for each instance. Do you want to describe um, a little bit how that happened? What were you after to make that clear when we went, when that whole narrative, that image narrative that unfolds in the book after? Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the location is very important as you and also Mongsho says, but uh, it's not that I choose the location, but I was chosen. So I was chosen, or the Gramsci monument was chosen. That's very important. And I think in this book, you can find out how this work, or how this can work out. Um, actually, I, made, I showed you, in the very important was this map of New York City, which is actually the NYCHA map, the New York City Housing Authority Developments. There are 300 in New York City. Uh, there are more than 500,000 New Yorkers living in public housings. So I went to 42 of them in order to look around, and you can find in the book some photos of all them. It's very interesting, actually, because they have all more or less the same architecture. But it's not about the architecture. It's about people. It's about persons. And actually, in this book, and that's why I'm happy that we could document this in this book, this is a photo of Clyde Thompson. Clyde Thompson was a very, very important person for uh, the Gramsci monument and also for the Gramsci monument in a forest house. Because he is the man I uh, meet once because Kelly, Megan, the staff of DIA, made for me an appointment with somebody in Forest Houses Community Center. And it was this person, Clyde Thompson. And uh, uh, Clyde, Clyde and Diane Herbert, the director of the community center, and who and him, who is char in charge with the youth as in forest houses. So it starts, as always, I explained in a few words, 
with my very basic English, my project. And then uh, the, the, the conversation starts and there is a small note and I'm very happy and also a little bit proud that uh, I wrote down at this moment uh, about what happened, these moments with Clyde. When Clyde asked me uh, about um, the benefits for the community and also in his word, he told me, sell us your project. So uh, it's good that in the book we can have these elements to find out that this is the start of a very fragile process uh, to, got, to get together or to uh, open a dialogue. And uh, six times after, uh, I met uh, Clyde and tried to convince him. He brought me after in contact with Eric Farmer, who was even more important in a way because he was the key figure uh, to me. Eric, uh, why? Because I needed somebody who was around every day, who had not already a, a kind of uh, job there uh, as like Clyde who is in the community center so and uh, Eric uh, was the person who I could meet thanks to Clyde. Clyde presented me to Eric. Eric is the uh, president of the resident association and he lives there since more than 40 years in forest houses and he was the person who invites me to do the Gramsci Monument there. So he chose me to do the Gramsci Monument there. So it's not me who chose the location, it's somebody who I could meet after I met other people who told me, yes, Thomas, we will help you, we will do together the Gramsci Monument. And then um, it starts, you can, yes, please show this. Yes, it's, it's, it continues with um, uh, where we are going tomorrow to present the book in the gymnasium of Forest Houses where Clyde and, and Eric did organize a meet and greet meeting in order to present the project. But I think that that's why the inclusion of this ephemera and the inclusion of all these images, the emails, the list that you made, um, the pictures you took when you went on your own to look at the different sites, starts building a journal almost or a, an archive that I feel that con brings uh, elements of, um, at least for me, I see it, as a, as, a, as a recipe almost, like a, a cooking book or a making book, a book that can be used and if, if followed, um, one can understand your process, right? So I think that there's a, also this dimension that is not just a book that um, full of testimonies or um, reflection, critical reflection, as in the case of um, Benjamin Buchlo's essay, uh, Responding to the Monument. Um, but also the evidence of your process and your thinking. And, and I feel that one of the elements of uh, important contributions is your own writings, which um, we included, writings that date back to 2003, the first one, your statements on monuments, and then followed by writings that you did 10 years later as we were preparing to go to forest houses. And the last writing, which was your response to what happened, right? So you're, you've been writing for a very long time. Um, MIT published that wonderful book of your text. And we felt that it was important to include your, your thinking into the book. So you are also participating here as an author, not just the creator of the project, but also a writer. Can you um, describe a little bit how you feel about the inclusion of this text? Um, in particular, uh, there's one text that seems always to rub people the wrong way, which is the on-share authorship text, where you're trying to articulate your relationship to people that help build your projects. And you describe them as not sharing the authorship with you not being participatory in that, in that level. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, Tell us more about the what The unshared you authorship, <laughs> that's something new. Yes. I invited it. You invented, invented it. it. Yes. I invented it. Yes. I invented it because uh, I couldn't... We cannot, in, in, in the Gramsci monument, but also in other projects re I made recently, like um, Flamme Eternelle, we cannot more go with the old model of sharing responsibility. Therefore, I made these schemas of the unshared authorship. And these schemas, very simple. This is the old model. The old model starts always with the thinking of a common bear of 100%. We have to share 50, 50, 40, 20, uh, 40 or 10, 10, 10, 10, etc. We have to share. This is the problem. The problem is it's always shared. It's never at all. It's always less than the total. It's always less. It's always diminishing something. And uh, I think we cannot, that's not the future. The future is to make it richer, to make it. Uh, more than 100%. And therefore, I invented the unshared authorship. And the, share, and the unshared authorship is 100%. Actually, it's me. Yes, I am 100% author. And but where do you see that? I'm not alone. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. not alone. <laughs> That's what I invent, I invite the others to be 100% as well. So then we be 200, 300, Is that why we're not sharing? Because we're all contributing 100%. Absolutely. It means, but of course, it means to be an author needs the emancipatory gesture to say, I am 100% author. So it's not for free. It's not something, and that's why it's unshared. And why it is new and people don't understand it for the for a moment, because it's something who is exponential, who is additive, who is growing and not diminishing. So this is why, to me, this is a very important um, schema. It's perhaps not an ideal thing, but it's the schema who guides me in the project like the Gramsci monument. And it is, of course, an affirmation. And there, actually, on the cover, and it was not my form, it was, I think, you for, your form, or the form of the graphic designer. This give already a form of what I thought with this idea of unshared authorship. Gramsci monument, it is my monument, it's my work, yes, I'm 100%, I take the responsibility, 100% responsibility for. And there are all people, who are invited to take over. Sometimes they did it. They told it to me. They told it to me. I am the artist. I made the Gramsci monument. Sometimes they didn't express. That's not important. They're, they're all the people who could also take over the unshared authorship of the Gramsci monument. That's um, a, tradu a traduction you made, or the graphic designer, or Stephen Robert made of this idea of unshared authorship. Yeah, I mean, it was an evolution. It, it was in part a result of being um, struggling with the acknowledgments, if you remember. Remember? You don't remember. But we had a hard time figuring out how to thank all the people that helped build the monument in a significant way, like contributing, not, not financial contribution, but contributing to the creation of it. People who gave you names of poets, people who gave you um, suggestions for the, the, the scholars to invite. Um, we have the people that participated, that they were employees of the monument, the 50 people that DIA hired to work in the monument, um, the construction crew, um, well, yeah. We, yeah, they are all the people these, who these, either who participate, monument, who yeah. were present, mm -hmm. who gave uh, input, or in, in a one way or in another one, or in another way, who could uh, be the authors of 
the Gramsci monument. Um, could I please, uh, Yasmil, go again to one of the other contributions? It's the contribution of a resident of forest houses. It's uh, Marcella Paradise. Marcella Paradise, who was also the librarian. So Marcella did also um, um, a text in her own words, the Gramsci monument through the eyes of Marcella Paradise. And uh, uh, <laughs> I must say, I was struck um, how was her, how just, how logic, and her, how precise was her description of the artist. My description of Thomas includes three words, idealist, fanatic, and amazing. So I liked a lot, I liked a lot fanatic. Fanatic. And, <laughs> fanatic. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it is, it comes from um, Marcella, who also is a poet. Uh, and she made a beautiful, contribution, a really very beautiful contribution, and I'm very happy that it is in the book. It was just a, on her smartphone, a text she wrote, it's called Why or Why Not? And so I'm happy that it is also in, in the book, something wh what was really hurt, touching to me mm. when she was showing it. And I think Marcella is not alone. I mean, we had, remember, Fred Morton, who's a poet who participated as, as in the poetry series. He developed a new poem on his way there, on his way to Forest Houses, a poem that is reproduced in the book. And also we had uh, Moncho's friend, Ura Joan Noel, who made a reggaeton song during one of the open mic events. So I think that these, these creations that we were able to capture in the book that came while we were at the monument, maybe speak or, or clarifies, for, at least for me, what you mean when you say that these projects are part of your guideline of presence and production. I think oftentimes people don't really understand what you mean when you say that the 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 event, or let's say in the case of the Grand Tree Monument, is part of your guideline of presence and production. And for me, it becomes very clear with Marcela's poem, or with the artworks that were made at the art school, or the kids' production in the workshops with Lex, or in the case of Ura Joan's song, or Fred Moulton's um, poem, that there was an ongoing production occurring inside the monument, in a way that turn the monument into an artist studio, in a studio, a studio, yeah, make for, for making art. Um, do you want to clarify a little bit the term, the guidelines of presence and production? Yeah, I mean, presence and production, of course, are first guidelines I wrote down in order to say um, I am, I'm committed to, I can be, I can be present every day. That's a artistic decision. It needs me every day. It needs to me be there every day. Not as an artist, but as a caretaker. Clyde understood it really good to take care about something. So he needs the artist. Not only at the opening the artist is there, he's there every day to care about. So that's the presence uh, factor. The other factor is uh, uh, the Production, because when you are there, you're producing something. And uh, of course, you're producing encounters, you're produ producing conflict, you're producing friendship, you're producing um, a discussion, or you're producing um, uh, your own work, and of course, the other who are there, like you, because you are there, are producing as well. And this is uh, how I understand presence and production project also as an opposition to community art, to relational aesthetic art, to educational art. Um, I must, I'm, I, I felt I must define my own terms for my work of art. And there are 
uh, in this kind, in, in, the, in the Gramsci monument, it is a presence and production project. So why? Because I'm present all day and I'm producing something, but I'm not alone present and I'm not alone producing something. Because when you are there and producing something, other people are there and also producing something. And this is how I understand the, 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 the guideline of presence and production. And for example, in the book, we had um, a, a, a few examples of presence and production. For example, a very funny one, uh, a kind of reversed uh, hegemony. In the, in the library, with all these books from and about Gramsci, a woman from the neighborhood came, and I'm very happy that we can show the picture in the Gramsci monument book, and she put some, I don't know how you call it, magazines, people magazines inside, because she thought it is missing something in the library. In the library. So uh, I thought this is a very interesting production. It was one of the somewhere. favorite spots of the interns that we had um, <laughs> working with us. And also yeah. for the kids, there, is, there was another production I think um, you were responsible of was um, Yasmil, was uh, uh, the, the point where people could get an apple. Um, it was called a Gramsci apple a day keeps consumption away. So there was a, an apple and, um, uh, and it was really, uh, uh, there was apples and people, and kids or people could come and, and take the apples away. And um, without going into an anecdote, um, uh, because it was quite successful, but because you wrote in the ambassador note about uh, that every, uh, every evening there was no more apples there, um, there was also one of the kids who did a beautiful interpretation of, of this and made a production. He made a production. He wrote Gramsci was in prison, prison, Gramsci left apples before he went to prison. So uh, this is also a kind of production uh, which arises among a lot of others. I think maybe before we open up for one more question, maybe worth um, touching up on one of the great points that Benjamin Buchlo made in his text, which I, for me was interesting and, and it spoke to other things that we discussed while we were at the monument, which was the role of museums, right? We, we in a way, built a, a temporary museum. You call it a, a monument. It was a monument to Antonio Gramsci, obviously, but from my perspective, from the perspective of a curator, not wearing my ambassador role, but from the other role that I had to share, um, for me, it opened up questions about the potentiality of museums in, in the future, this proximity to residents, um, to a place where people live, the modesty of the structure in which we were operating from, the fact that we had uh, very expensive equipment there, but yet nothing was stolen onto really the last days, and except for the drills, which seem to have been very popular um, among the community. But um, we locked every night with bicycle locks, and um, we didn't need to have armed guards, and so on, security, heavy security. There was uh, precious objects that we borrowed from the Italian Casa Gramsci in Sardinia, which were artifacts of, of patrimony of the, of the culture, of the Italian culture, which are Gramsci's utensils and his comb, his wallet, his slippers. So we had these uh, very valuable artifacts, and yet we didn't need to have uh, guards uh, the, the professional way which we find in museums and so forth. There are many levels I could talk from what for me was really instructive about this, um, the decisions in which we took, that you took and you help us understand as we build this, 
to create a space in which that production can occur. So that the kids, as Lex calls them, and she mentioned that you use the phrase the motor, they were the motor, the motor of the monument, that the classroom was the motor of the, of the monument. I remember them being always around. I remember them participating of Marcus' philosophy lecture, sitting there not understanding what he's saying about Heidegger, but yet they were coexisting with the adults, and it was a very multi-generational audience. And Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Buclo calls this a desirable community. That in your proposals for um, projects in which involve presence and production at this scale, you're after this utopian community that um, ideally institutions like museums and exhibition spaces may strive for, right? And um, I find it really reassuring that we were there to witness that. At least I feel that I can speak for a lot of the staff members at DIA who went on a regular basis because I was not allowed to come to, not allowed, but it was encouraged not to come to the city uh, for meetings. So the, the staff at DIA had to come to the Bronx on a almost daily basis uh, to meet with me and early in the morning before we opened the monument or late in the afternoon after we closed the monument. I mean, Stephen got his job interview at, I don't know, eight in the morning, something like this. <laughs> so I remember that um, it was so reassuring for us also to see that, especially in a situation which Dia right now doesn't have a presence in Manhattan as we used to be across the street, and, um, and we are reinventing what the potential of the future for DI is in a space, and seeing it um, in this precarious form that you invented was uh, energizing for us, and it reassured us that um, museums can be many, many, many things and take many, many forms. But one of the things that spoke, and I feel that I hope that people witness um, was for me the mo one of the most important lessons was the immense diversity of the audience, right? That the, the presence of forest houses embraced this project and participated of it, but also a great deal of people travel to forest houses to be part of this um, project and that it didn't stop them, that they had to take the subway for an hour and a half from Brooklyn to go there to be part of this experience. So I think also the, there was a breakdown of the myths of the institutions carry that one has to be located at a particular site of popularity or um, uptown or somewhere um, where there's uh, tourism in order to be people be interested in art. So that was um, my way of, of, I don't have a question for you, it's just a, a comment of what I saw from my perspective as a, as a curator. Okay, yeah, of course. Uh, I just want uh, to perhaps uh, add something about the book and actually your text, Desegregating, Desegregating the Experience of Art, a User Guide to Gramsci Monument. I was really um, struck to read uh, uh, in this, in your text actually, uh, the part concerning the struggle of the artist in doing a kind of uh, project like this. Uh, I was struck because it was fair, it was, uh, it was without compromising uh, you or the institution or me, it was uh, lucid, lucid, um, and it also I think uh, honest and with full transparency which uh, I think is needed in text about artworks and also artworks in sp specifically uh, where artists are uh, working uh, or performing are there every day. So I think this is a very, to me, I never wrote a, I never read, wrote a text um, like this before about uh, this part, uh, my part of work, but also there is a big deal of information inside uh, about how uh, the Gramsci monument was, how we, we did it, how it was built. And I just want uh, to quote 
uh, you mentioned this, and somebody may be interested, perhaps, to find out. And there is this quote, on January 22, 2013, less than a month after Hirschhorn's encounter with Eric Farmer, and only four months prior to the schedule, first day of construction, an ambiguous and non-committal approval was granted by former chairman of NYCHA, John Rea, to move forward with preparations. He lukewarm support was essentially an I won't stop you. And it was Eric Farmer's approval that the project really needed. During the meeting in the NYCHA office in downtown Manhattan, in the middle of a snowstorm, Farmer, Eric Farmer, answered the chairman's question, why should this happen at Forest Houses with the unflinching, unflinching thing, because nobody is offering anything else. So I, I really appreciate uh, this kind of uh, uh, honesty in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this text, but also, uh, and to me, I, want, I don't want to miss it, uh, a footnote you add, thanks uh, to Stephen Hoban, the editor, because it's the last footnote in your text, in one last act of grace, Stephen Hoban, editor of the publication, came across a memorandum in the NYCHA archives that revealed an unseen achievement of historical, historical significance. 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 Forest Houses was the first successfully disaggregated public housing development in New York City. So, uh, <laughs> it's what I, what I really think is important that there are different layers. You can go through the books and until the footnotes where you can gather uh, an information who, who can help you to understand how an enterprise like the Gramsci Monument uh, can be, uh, can be uh, hold up. Hmm. Great. I think we should let people ask us a few questions, if you agree. Yeah? Okay. I see nice faces <laughs> in the audience. You have a question, Stephen? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I guess uh, my question's for both of you. Um, I was curious, given it's been almost two years since the monument, if um, looking at the book opened up any gaps, um, if it um, conflicts with your memory of the monument in any way, or if anything in it is, um, has changed your understanding of the monument, if there were any surprises? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I think the Gramsci monument will be my last uh, presence and production project with uh, what I call programmation. Um, I don't regret it, but there was a lot of programmation in the Gramsci monument, and I know now, after Flamme Eternel, the future will be non-programmation. And thanks to the Gramsci monument, I understood it. It is not, it's not about programmation. Everybody can program. Everybody can make a programmation. Even me, I did. But now the future will be non-programmation, I think. So what do I you learned mean it. by that? Thomas. I mean programmation. Like no program. The daily, no program. The daily events, mm -hmm. uh, the weekly events. Every day, every week, you know, at this hour there will happen this. I think this is what I learned. I, Gramsci monument don't need programmation. Art don't need programmation. A museum don't need programmation. An artwork don't need a program. You know, uh, I think that's what I learned. And that's why, consequently, I try it uh, with Flamme Eternel, a project without programmation. Um, so this is what I learned about uh, not only this, but also this uh, with the programmation of the Gramsci moment. 
uh, flamme eternel, yeah, I mean, the non-programmation is the future. Like I tell you, I think unshared authorship is the future, non-programmation is the future. Uh, but non-programmation is very difficult to do because we are, condi we have, we are conditionated to program. Everybody knows, oh, I have to go there because these and these people are speaking or whatever. So you, what you mean is non-scheduled non presence. So when we went to Flamme Eternel, I arrived and I was at Palais de Tokyo at noon when they opened, and I didn't know if uh, Rancière was speaking that day. So it was a lottery if I were to be there at the time that the, poet, the philosopher, the poet started to talk. So is that what you mean when you say no programmation, that, that the, the, you're expecting the visitor to run the risk of missing something important? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the Gramsci monument, the, the, the residents, they were there every day. They made the non-programmation. Yeah, the residents um, were there every and, day. Uh, they didn't need a program. They didn't need a program. They didn't need hours uh, for this and this. So I think this is uh, what, uh, what can be worked out. It's very difficult to do because uh, we have no time. And uh, because you have no time, you cannot do anything. So you must take the risk to miss something, absolutely, uh, to come too late or to have to leave uh, earlier. Uh, but I think in the non-programmation are these precarious moments of grace which achieved, we were achieved also in the Gramsci monument. But uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, in the future, I think, um, this will be, um, uh, in every case for me, to respond to you, Stephen, this will be the next step uh, without a program, working without a program. For me, I, I, it's a good question, but <laughs> it's a hard one. I think that one of the things that maybe we'd, we we're missing or I'm missing from the book, it's... Um, the struggle. I mean, everything looks so organized in the book and, um, and clean and made into some sort of logic structure that um, it's missing for, I mean, I know from my memories, um, the rain during Marcus' talk, all the natural effects, the bugs, the mosquitoes, the heat, and all the, the almost like, um, yeah, right, the, the life, all the, all the life that was unexpected, um, that is not here, but that is uh, in me. So, but um, that, I would say, is the only thing that the sounds, right, the voices, the, the music, DJ Gucci play every day Mariah Carey for me. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> it's a, they're the jokes, the, the silliness, uh, people bringing food uh, for you to eat and things like this. Um, but th those are the memories, right? And one of the things I, I, I say is that um, that became clear, the decision of not having captions in the book also creates this um, insider, uh, inter in, in, interior knowledge. So certain people like Kelly, Megan, me, Manuel, we know the names uh, of the people that were working with us all the time, so we can recognize them in the book, in the in the picture. So it becomes like a yearbook. So I, I would say that that's also a joy that the book has that I like a lot. That then, if you knew the person, then you know who that is, um, the ambassador from Switzerland, right? We don't we don't put his name, but he's the one shaking my hand. Um, so I think that this is a, a, po a positive thing, even though I, I do miss the uh, the other elements that could not be captured. Uh, just to add a little bit, uh, Stephen, uh, in, in uh, the text I wrote about an artist was. What did I learn about the Gramsci monument? And there are nine other points <laughs> that I learned besides non-programmation from the Gramsci monument. I'm going to take a question. I'm going to take a question. Sorry, I'm going to go to Hell first. You may. 
this is more a comment than a question. Uh, I'm very interested in this no more programmation because more and more we have art spaces, big art spaces, and more and more these big art spaces want presence. They want liveness. And so I think the artist, more and more, is asked to program being there. So I'm happy to hear that you want to resist this institutional demand. I mean, I want to be there, but without a program, without uh, being asked to be there, actually. But you are absolutely right. There is, I think, perhaps uh, you, I don't know, um, you were interested in this question who arised in the Gramsci monument about institution, the, uh, about the institution. But today, of course, uh, uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, this demand to perform as an artist, you know. Everybody now, even the Centre Cultural Suisse in Paris, uh, does it now. So, uh, because... Even the uh, French. <laughs> even the French are asking that from you? <laughs> no. They are Swiss, the Centre Cultural Suisse in Paris. Um, but this is true, this is true. But uh, the problem is, the presence and production, how I understand it, must be a gift an aggressive gift in a, in a Bataillon way, and not uh, to respond on uh, the ask, the, the, the demand of the institution. But I think also, Thomas, if I remember correctly, we were not listing the hours of our programs on our website, right, Melissa? We, we only listed the days. Sorry, I don't, <laughs> uh, I mean, I made, I made every day, I made every day the two panels, you're right, not on the website, but uh, on the panels, you know, I'm speaking more about these panels, the weekly and the daily panel. Um, so I, I, there were the, the hours, you know, fixed hours. So, um, yeah. you know, here, the, the, days. Uh. the, day, the days yeah. and the hours, you know, was, was, was fixed. Yeah. So. There was a schedule. Yeah, the yeah. schedule. So mm -hmm. what you're saying, in the future, we are, you're abandoning that. Yeah. yeah, I think this is how I, I see as something constructive the experience with the Gramsci monument, that I learned, I learned something. Perhaps it's not more necessary to write 11, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, to look, for example, what is interesting in no program or no programmation. And I try to do it. In the, uh, for, for example, Flamme Tonnel, that something occur parallelly, parallel, yes? So uh, you cannot be on the same, you cannot be there and there, but it's just, you don't miss something, it's not a problem. Uh, therefore, uh, I think to put the hours uh, there uh, the, is not more, not, not more necessary. I have a, do you want to go back in? I wanted to ask about this idea of the instruction manual or sort of the recipe book, as we were saying earlier, um, because of course we have so many young artists who are interested in socially engaged or participatory art projects just like Gramsci Monument. So I'm curious how you see this book being a tool and what you think maybe young artists could learn from a project like the Gramsci Monument. Uh, I always learn when you are doing something. I mean, learn is perhaps not the word. I like to say learn. Myself, in my text, what I, 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 I say what I learned. But when I learn, I'm not going to the school. I make an affirmation, and then I found out, oh, it's not, it's not like this it works, for example, you know? So I make an experience. I experience something. So, for example, the four monuments I did, I, every time I experienced something, the first one, the Spinoza monument was the smallest, the most compact monument, where actually nobody, or only one person was as resident involved. So I thought I must go forward, because I had very nice contact with the person there. So then I made the Dulles monument, where I uh, 
wanted to work with the community in Avignon and did it. But I learned, that was the first time I learned that it is not enough just to build with the community together a, a monument, but also then you have to carry it to take care of the whole duration. So I learned this in the Delos monument. So that therefore, when I made the Batai monument, I wanted to be there all the time and I invented the term presence and production because I learned that now I need to be there all the time, not only for the construction, but also to uh, the duration. But for example, the Batai monument was not very productive. There was not a lot of production, actually. So therefore, I'm happy to say in the Gramsci monument, there was a lot of production. So because there was a lot of uh, uh, presence, but also production, not only from myself, from the ambassador, from a lot of other people, and of course from the people from the neighborhood. There was the most productive, not uh, quantitatively, but quali from, the, from, uh, from the energy, I think, the most productive. So I learned from every day, and now I learned about the non-programmation. So uh, that's how I understand when you do an experience. You try then um, not to make no errors. It's not about it. There is no error or failure in this way. It's just to make a real experience, to affirm something and to give and try to follow this and try to stand it out. So it's very important, this part of an ex making an experience and try uh, uh, to transform this experience to, of, uh, to, to something. So the, the idea of the manual, which I think is what Megan was after, um, the idea that the book is structured from the construction, the field work, the, how the idea initiated, the field work, the construction phase, the, the, the actual running of the project, and then the dismantling, it's, it's your way of sort of explaining to somebody who didn't see the monument, who didn't visit, how this comes about and how this was dismantled and, uh, yeah, and closed, right? Exactly. Okay. I'm going to take one last question. Hi, I'm also very Hi. interested in the idea of the unprogrammed future, but I'm curious, Thomas, how you understand the future of the physical structures in your work in relationship to that, because as I understood the monument in one sense, there were almost two monuments. There was the physical infrastructure you created and then also the programming. And in some cases, the fit between them was very tightly calibrated, say in the, the library or museum space. And in some cases, like the children's workshop, it was very open-ended. Um, so again, how will sort of the physical infrastructure of your work exist without the programming? I think it's crucial, but to me, uh, it's crucial. I, I understand that I think it's important what you mention. Uh, it's very important to me to do all this work, um, to do the structure. I mean, here clearly with the residents also together in order to implant it in the in this space, to let it grow slowly, to do it together. And it's not two monuments, it's one monument, but it's very important to do the work of the structure, of the architecture. It's the same when I made the Palais de, in the Palais de Tokyo, Flamme Tonnel. People say, yeah, why you needed all these tires, 16,000 tires, why you need it? Yes, I need each tire, each small cardboard, each sign, each indication in order to make because my idea is this of this gift of this aggressive gift to the other because it's not about to create to put chairs and the microphone it's to do a work before that obligate in a way the visitor or the passerby or the person the resident to also do something and to also give something from, from them own or their own. So therefore, I think this, this is necessary. To me, I see it as very as necessary. Not only architect, the architectural, but also the, uh, the struggle, 
to do it. <laughs> the difficult. Um, um, for example, uh, it's very important, um, the, uh, you know, to confront the question of security, of safety, etc., uh, etc. Et because, of course, there are things easier to do. A tent, you know, you can hire a tent, you can hire chairs, they are, they are not burning, whatever, you know what I mean. Uh, you have no, not all, all, but I think, then you go directly into uh, this kind of consumption of culture or of, of, of an event I'm not interested in. I'm interested in the transformation of the event. And that you can only do, I think, when you transform before something. You know? So therefore, therefore, this question is a very important question. Um, and I like, actually, that in the book, there is a quite a big part of documentation about how the shelves are made uh, with a lot of work, how, uh, look for example in the construction, how we tried uh, in this difficult, um, in the quite difficult um, um, situation on the ground, how we try to build, to build the bridge, how we try to fill the holes inside you know, with small pieces of wood. You can say, okay, is this not is it not important, is it not better to have to find an easier way, yeah, perhaps? But I think each piece of wood, uh, strangely put, only with the will to, to make it flat, uh, to make it uh, even, uh, gives uh, already, um, uh, gives already, um, 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 a kind of uh, uh, is a manifestation of you, yeah, of an effort, and that you need to make an effort also. So I see it like this. That's my vision of how it is important, why it is important to do all this work. Should we? Wrap it up? Okay. <laughs> okay.